So what happens sometimes when the church is set up and you begin to let them people come in, you begin to judge them before they come to the door. But you want them in your church. And you begin to forget where you came from. You begin to forget that you was once on them streets too. That's the truth. You begin to forget that. Right? And my brother would talk to me, he said, Dre, man, them people don't want to see me, man. Even. But there's a problem in the church community and in the community that we're going to have to fix. Don't have me bring them in and I bring them in and you judge them. And if you can't handle, get somebody that come from where they come from, put them on your church board so that when they come in, they know how to treat them. I know it because I hear the voice of them out there and I hear what they're saying to me. And I'm just telling you, if I bring them in, make sure you treat them like you love them. You see, let me explain one other thing to us since we're having this wonderful conversation. You see, the gossiping in the church, it don't play on the streets. Let me tell you why. Because on the streets, when you say some things out your mouth and you don't produce it, they'll kill you. They'll kill you. So you just can't get to talking about people and saying this about people. But in the church, there's no consequence like that. There's a lot of things that come on that happen within our churches. We do because there's no consequence for the things that we do. There's consequences out there, right? Sometimes we are guilty of preaching a rated PG Bible. And the Bible's rated X. The reason why it's necessary for the people out there to realize that so they can understand that whatever you think you're going through is in the book. Whatever you think you're going through, no matter how hard you are, no matter what situation you think you done went through, it's in the book. But if we don't tell them, then they'll feel ostracized that you won't understand. We need the rated X gospel. It is imperative for the land that we live in at this time. So at some point, I believe there has to be a separation and a division and a dividing in the body. It's coming. Oh, it's coming. Because the scripture said it was. And it's necessary. Because he only really only needed a remnant anyway. You know, God is not into numbers. God is not into numbers. He don't care whether the church is filled up. He said, give me five. Just give me five of them. Five of them troopers. He said, give me 12 of them disciples. Just give me 12 of them. I'll go shake up the world with this. He's 12. I don't need no more. Just give me 12. We need to give these brothers out here some real art. And there might be a young brother out there right now that may be thinking about going the wrong way. And it's my job to let him know, look, bro, you ain't going to be no bigger than what I was in the streets ever. You will never reach the level that I got to. This is the truth. Y'all know it. You will never reach the level I got to. So hear it coming from me, from the top guy that was in it 20 years ago. You understand? Hear it coming from the top. So I need to speak into them brothers' lives because them as black men, we need to start leading our communities. I got to fight where the fight is. My father would tell me, Andre, if the devil was fair, he wouldn't be the devil. So I got to take the fight to where the fight is. Right in the mud. See, a lot of people, we see them areas and we see dark. I see light and opportunity. So because we see dark, we stay in the church where it's safe. It's safe over here. You know, oh, you just keep staying in the church. I'll go ahead and do the hard work. We stay in the church where it's safe. The church was never made for worship. It was made for discipleship. First, worship after. Discipleship. Go out to the world and make me disciples. Are we building disciples? See, when I life coach or I go to 
all these places I might speak to, whether I go to the prisons or whatever, a lot of them brothers don't have no fathers. The church was supposed to be the surrogate father. It's the truth. But we're not doing a good job. I can't just keep telling you that we're doing everything good because I can't spur you to do nothing better. If I just keep saying everything is all okay, everything is not okay. So if I keep telling you that the need is so pressing, you know, then it might spur us as a community to do what needs to be done because we need our communities back. Yes, we've been devastated. Yes, there's been laws, like I talked about earlier, what oppression means about corrupt laws, the laws he put in place in the 90s and then 80s that they were disruptive to our communities and caused a lot of our black men to be put in prisons under unjust law. I don't want any more casualties. If I could do, I'm doing everything I can. And I told uh, Mrs. Uh, Catherine O'Toole, the chief of police, Right? We sat down, I talked with her. She called me again yesterday. She really wants to do something for the community because she feels like there's something that we can do together. I'm with that. I'm with that. But we need to, I can't stand it. Every time I look around and hear all around the country, our brothers, our babies are dying. They're dying. And we have to take a great look and do whatever is necessary. You know, we always say, what would Jesus do? What do you think what he would do? And what you think he would do, you should be doing it. Give me a hand clap for that one. <laughs> whatever you think what Jesus would be doing, you should be doing it. The moment you say, what would Jesus do? That means you must know something. This community, friends, loved ones come out hand in hand, standing with us hand in hand to get justice and exactly what I'm going to do with your help. Because I believe it's not me. It's going to take the people. The people have to rise up. It will always be the people. Do not allow the responsibility and accountability to leave your hands. I'm a steward working towards it just with you, along with you. It's going to take us to rise up. This here is powerful. We got a lot of work. We're going to have to get some justice for Shay, and we're going to have to go win back our men. And once we win back the men, and they can lead, because they ain't been doing a good job leading, and the women will follow. We have no order. There's no order. Everybody wants to be in everybody else's position. There's no order. And we need order. God is extremely orderly. I want to thank my wife. She, listen, I was in the game, and when I met that woman there, I made the right decision. I went, you know, I went to federal prison, but I met my wife two months before I went to federal prison. And I told her, you know, you're a square. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't really, you know, I'm not, because I was in the streets, I, I'm not really into squares. <laughs> but I was on the run from the police, too. <laughs> <laughs> And so I told her, I said, you know, some of them people, them, them hip people, might not do this three months with me. I said, but if you could do those, those, no, three years, those three years with me, then I know you have to be the one. And so I finally got caught by the police, did my time, and she was in San Diego, because I was out there for the Super Bowl, and they caught me and moved me back to Las Vegas. She moved from San Diego to Las Vegas. When they sentenced me, they sent, me, they, left, they sent me from Las Vegas to Tucson, Arizona. She packed up and moved and went to Phoenix, Arizona to be with me. The feds moved me everywhere. Then they moved me from Tucson, <laughs> moved me to Victorville. She packed up from Phoenix, moved to Victorville this is to be with me. She never missed one visiting time, always was there for me. And as a caveat, my father had a kidney disease called FSGS. It's hereditary to me, glad my brother did. But I got that kidney disease and 2010, my kidneys failed. My wife gave me a kidney. I kind of mess with her, I say, honey. She said, I gave you a kidney. I said, yeah, but I gave you a rib. <laughs> Could you come stand before I go, honey? Come up here with me.
And I'd be telling these brothers all the time, you guys be looking at me and talking about Dre, you this, you that. Listen, if the sacrifice wasn't made, I wouldn't even be here. She gave me life. I love her. My kids, I have a son here, Anthony, graduated Yale last year. Stand up, Anthony. <laughs> Got a wife and two beautiful children. My daughter's married. What you, how many years now is Rihanna? Stand up. That's my six years married. My son here, Kylan. Stand up, young fella. He's a model, handsome fella. I have a daughter that goes to UCLA right now. My other daughter's married uh, to a military guy. I'm just telling you, there's life after the streets. Where's my other little daughter at? My youngest? Where's Imani? Stand up, my little youngest daughter. My challenge. I love her. My beautiful challenge there. That's my baby. I, all I do in my life every day is try to show the story of redemption for our brothers and sisters. Because you know where I come from and know what I had to do to get this, trans, this story of redemption. God is faithful. 18 years married. Me? You don't have an excuse. <laughs> Me? Mr. Big Pimp Guy? And she got me, too. Yeah, you know, she got me, too. So just be encouraged. Look it. There is life after the streets. There's life after the streets for anyone that wants to transition. I am a living example that you could do it and your family could be blessed. It could happen. It has happened for me. I was worse than you. That's what God do. He'll take the worst fella. I said in TBN, the chief sinner, and redeem his life so that he can use for his glory as a testament to the world. I love my brother. Thank you for coming.